We continue the study of Subramani metric on Heisenberg group, and we have intentionally postponed the definition of any group structure on it. And so far to us, the objects we've introduced are these special vector fields, x, y, and t, which we declare to be orthonormal in a new Riemannian metric that we put on R3. Then we look at those absolutely continuous curves whose derivatives lie in the span of just x and y. And this span we call the horizontal plane at that point. And because we have this metric G, we can integrate the, the modulus, the length, the length of the derivative in this metric to define a length for horizontal curves. And finally, the Subramanian metric or Carnot Carothéodry metric is defined by minimizing over the length of all horizontal curves that join P and Q. The goal is to prove that this does define a metric. The property of symmetry and being non-negative and also the triangle inequality are quite clear from definition. However, actually the difficulty lies in proving that this distance is finite to begin with because of the restriction to the plane in horizontal curves, we are not even sure if given any pair of points, we can connect them by a path, although we are always restricted to remain in that plane. So our goal will be to reach there in a few lectures. In general Subramanian manifolds, this is not an easy theorem and um, requires knowledge of brackets of vector fields and many other differential geometric concepts. However, we're going to take advantage of the special coordinate system that we have on H1 or in a, on HN in general to, to deduce this from very concrete calculations. One of the very important objects that helps this happen is that of projections. But before that, let me actually talk about a new object on Heisenberg group, and that is called the contact point four. So in H1, which is R3 in particular, this is very easy. So any plane is determined uniquely by its unit vector, which is perpendicular to every vector there. So if you cross product the vectors x and y, you can see that the normal vector is pointing in the direction minus 2y plus 2x and 1. But because we will be also be working in general hn, uh, the better language to describe this is to introduce a 1 form. If you're not familiar with the notion of forms on manifolds, you can only, because we're talking only about one forms, you can think of just dot product. So what happens when this object alpha acts on a partial partial x plus b partial partial y and c partial partial t, is just dot producting the respective vector. So dt has to deal with partial t, so that gives us a c, and then you get from dx corresponds to a, so minus 2ay, and then plus 2bx. That is how um, a one form acts on a one vector. Again, because this alpha comes from this uh, cross product, we can see that it is very easy to see the following proposition that um, given a point P, a vector V 
belongs to horizontal subspace at P if and only if alpha acting on that gives us zero. Now let's see a proof of this because there is some uh, other important outcomes of that. The proof relies on the following simple fact that if you have V written in, of course, any V can be written in as a span, in the span of partial x, partial y, partial t, because that's just a, a basis for the whole tangent space, plus c, partial, partial y. Then, if we try to write it in the coordinate system x, y, and t, notice that the only vector that has a partial partial x in it is capital X. Here we have partial y. And the, these other factors here are just partial partial t's. So only partial partial t part sees some change. Therefore, the only way you can describe uh, v in xy coordinate system is also have the same a from up here. So and then plus for the same reason you will have b y p but this will introduce some extra partial partial t's from here which you have to take out so if you just calculate simply you will see that this is c minus 2 a y plus 2bx times the vector t. So this is true. It doesn't have to be horizontal vector. Any vector can be written in both bases, and this is how the coefficients connect to one another. So v belongs the horizontal plane at P if and only if, by definition of horizontality, it means it's in the span of x and y vector. That means the last part, c minus 2ay plus 2bx, must be 0. Um, but this is exactly the action of alpha on v. Indeed, well alpha is acts linearly, so alpha vanishes on x and y p, that is why it's even called the contact form, and it's easy to see that alpha acting on t is always equal to 1. So that's uh, the end of the proof that being horizontal happens if and only if alpha acting on a vector is zero. But to be honest, this part here is to me even more interesting because it just tells you that writing a, the switching between partial coordinate system and the capital XY system doesn't change the coefficient of x and y parts, only the coefficient of the t part changes. Okay, with that, now we are ready to talk about the uh, important subject of projections. Okay, so we will denote, denote by Uh, many different projections, but um, the, no the abuse in notation is justified by uh, many factors. So first of all, pi of the point x, y, t will be denoted just x, y. So this is a map from R3 into R2, and it's a contraction, a one Lipschitz map. Uh, but also, at every p, x, y, and t, we also denote 
by pi the projection the orthogonal projection from uh, the tangent space of R3 at P which is a copy of R3 into the span of just partial partial X and partial partial Y Okay, so later on we will see from the viewpoint of Lie group structure of H1, um, X and Y are the natural objects because they are left in variant translations, while partial partial X, partial partial Ys are kind of extrinsic objects. However, we are taking advantage of the fact that we have this coordinate system R on R3 and uh, deduce many properties. So we denote both of these by pi. Now there is an observation and that is a projection of x at p equals just partial partial x and similarly projection of vector y p is partial partial y independent of where the point p is and it turns out that this is true for all horizontal curves so pi of v is Okay, let's say if you have partial x, so if you have a horizontal curve, then it can be written just in terms of x and y. But then because pi is linear, and this is um, for x, p, and y, p, we have the quantities from above. So this will be partial x plus b partial partial y. What this tells us pictorially is quite interesting. So let me add a sketch here. So you are at some P here. And then here is your um, horizontal, say, plane. Now you have a vector v which lies in the horizontal plane, right? v belongs to the horizontal plane at p. The quantity above that the projection has the same a and b's in these coordinates is telling us that the projection onto the vertical, onto the horizontal, this horizontal being like in R3, will be will have exactly the same coordinates. So this will be projection of the vector v, and this will be v itself. This part, so I'm here writing v as a x p plus b y p, which uh, will be a partial partial x plus b partial partial y, and plus some quantity partial partial t, which is calculable in terms of a and b, as we saw up here, how you transfer between two expressions. So that will be this difference. Okay. From this, we actually get uh, an important equality about the length. So the length of the vector v in the g, so this is vector v length in g to the power 2 is v dot v in the g uh, norm. So this will be 
AXP plus BYP multiplied into itself. And because XP's and YP are orthogonal to each other and each has length one, this will be A squared plus B squared. So on the other hand, we see that the, in, in the coordinate system of R3, the length of V is equal to, uh, sorry, to the power two will be a squared plus b squared plus something squared, right? That question mark to the power two. And this is the Euclidean length of v as a vector if it was in R3 to the power two. So from this, we conclude that for every horizontal vector v by this i mean in the it lies in the span of x capital x and capital y we have that the length of that vector in the g metric is less than the length of the v in r3 so we get this vertical ascent for free. So um, notice here that this quantity is actually the length of pi of v, which happens to be a vector in R2. And if you take its norm R2, you get equal to that. So G metric, it's very important that we have switched from the usual inner product of R3 to the new inner product G. What it does is it gives us this vertical, this vertical part for free. The length of, so uh, I should probably add it here. So for every horizontal vector field, pi v in R2 is equal to that. So the g length of a vector is the Euclidean length of its projection. So whatever vertical part it has, it comes for free. And the vertical part uh, has this 2a y plus or minus 2bx part. And if x and y are really far away from the origin, the projection here, this can be a really large vector. So uh, if you get away from the origin, you get a lot of free vertical ascent. By free, I mean it doesn't show up in the norm of the vector. This will play some role later on. Well, let me also deduce a consequence of this last fact here, three. So if so it's a corollary of that fact. If gamma is a horizontal curve, then the length of gamma, which is always considered with the inner product G, so it's A to B, gamma prime, of s with respect to the g length ds is less than or equal to integral a to b now we can put gamma prime of s the r3 norm and ds and this is the length of gamma computed in the geometry of, sorry, R3. So if we have some horizontal curve in our space, its R3 length is greater than or equal to the 
length that we consider for the definition of the Carnot Carothedry distance. Okay. There is another thing happening with this projection, which we kind of hinted at by this equality that um, the length of a vector is equal to projection. It's uh, not just the length of the vector, but the whole inner product is preserved um, under the projection. So if V and W both are in the horizontal plane at some P, then dot producting V and W in this G metric is the same as dot producting their projections in R2. This is uh, easy because, easy to prove because uh, both sides are, so let me write a sketch then. So proof is that both sides are symmetric in V and W and linear in both V and W. So it suffices to check for V equals say XP and W equal to YP or again XP because the case of equality is also there, and this just follows easily. Seen basically by inspection. Or from this observation that for horizontal curves, yeah, from this one, proposition here, for horizontal vector field, vectors, the projection has the same expansion, has the same coefficient a and b. Okay, now these together give us the following, again, observation that if gamma is absolutely continuous, into R3. Oh, okay, yeah, we need actually more. So if gamma is horizontal, so it's absolutely continuous and also its derivative lies in the horizontal plane at almost every point, then at almost every s, Okay, gamma prime of S is a vector in R3, happens to lie in the horizontal plane. Okay, so if we project this vector, we get some vector in R2. This happens to be the derivative of projecting gamma to get a curve in R2 and then taking the derivative at s. This is uh, easy from everything that we said and uh, if you want to be super detailed you can write gamma as gamma 1, gamma 2 and gamma 3 and check for yourself. Again these are not too difficult facts but what follows from them is quite interesting. So it says that if you have this curve gamma and it's a horizontal curve then this projection of gamma uh, these vectors the derivatives of this vector uh, th this curve are projections of the tangents of the one above and then we saw that because it was horizontal the length is the same so from this, 
we have the very important corollary of this observation that um, at almost every s gamma prime of s length g equals the length of the projected curve okay this is getting annoying it tries to detect shapes come on a pi o gamma derivative length computed in the simple geometry of r2 and from that we see that uh, actually let me make it a theorem because this is quite important the theorem is that if gamma is a horizontal curve in h1 then the length of gamma computed with respect to this Riemannian metric G is the same as the length in the R2 geometry of the projection of the curve. Yeah, very important theorem. And proof is basically, so I worked backwards, so proof is contained there because if you write the definition of length gamma, why not write it? So length of gamma is integral of gamma prime of S with respect to G, DS, A to B. But then we saw from above that at almost every S, this is the same as pi O gamma's derivative at S computed, computed in R2 DS. But this is definition of the length of the projection in R2 world. So this becomes the length of the projection curve in the standard metric of R2. Pi O gamma. That's the end of the proof. So, um, again, the whole thing boils down to the fact that vertical projection of horizontal vectors has the same coordinates a b down there and because of the way this metric g is chosen the inner product is preserved okay what is one of the consequences of um, this thing well if you have two points given p equal x1, y1, and t1, and q equal x2, y2, and t2, the Carnot cartesian distance between p and q, this is probably the first quantitative explicit fact we, we are proving about the Carnot cartesian distance is at least the distance of the projections in R2. So that will be x1, y1, minus x2, y2 in R2. Sorry about that. I'll get around this uh, annoying glitch up there. And this is simply the square root, hoping it won't so this will be x1 minus x2 to the power 2 plus y1 minus y2 to the power 2. <laughs> Proof of the corollary. Well, we see that any horizontal curve 
if it exists, we don't get no from P to Q satisfies length of gamma is equal to the length in R2. Let me be consistent in my notation in the norm of R2 of pi O gamma. But this is a curve, pi O gamma is a curve that joins the projections of the points. So this is, and any curve in R2 that joins two points has length bigger than their, their distance. This is true actually in any metric space. So this will be the distance of projection of gamma at beginning. So that will be projection of P and then projection of Q because these are connected. Now this is for every curve. And you see that the right hand side is independent of the curve gamma. So we take infimum and we still have the inequality. So, but infimum is by definition DCCPQ of H1. So distance of pi P from pi Q. Okay, at this point, we don't know if, if this is finite or infinity, but the inequality nevertheless is true. If it's infinity, then it holds uh, trivially. So um, the message is clear, but let's really draw it as well because it's uh, such an interesting So imagine you have some way of connecting P and Q by a horizontal curve. What we just showed is that, well, the length of this curve is equal to the length of the projection onto R2. So this will be some sort of curving plane. And of course, it's connecting pi of Q to pi of P and this length definitely is more than the length of the straight line connecting them, which is the distance. Yeah, any horizontal curve, its length is equal to the L2 length of the projection. I repeat that because I'm gonna prove and finish with um, an equality about the CC metric. Okay, claim. Let's uh, write it as a proposition. For any x1 and y1, the Carnot Carthedri distance of x1, y1, 0 from zero, zero is actually equal to that distance. So this will be x1 to the power two plus y1 to the power two. Okay. So if your second point is also on the xy plane, you get that this is equal. So from previous fact, we have one inequality that the DCC uh, of, uh, let's call this point P1. So P1 from the origin zero, we know that it's at least equal to the distance of the projections of these vectors on XY plane, which is equal to X1. Okay, this is beyond annoying x1 to the power 2 plus y1 to the power 2. So it remains to prove the converse. And for that, we actually find one horizontal curve with that length. Um,
Okay, and the horizontal curve that we find depends on a fact that is easy to verify. Uh, if you are at a point here, in this case, x, y, one, y, one, zero, the horizontal plane at this point actually contains this vector. It contains this line, right? The horizontal plane is not actually flat except at the origin. So it is, it makes some angle with that, but nevertheless, it contains this line. So this line does go through it. This means if you move to another point here, again, the same is true. Of course, this plane is not smaller than that. It's the whole plane, but uh, to be able to draw, I did it. And uh, this is for any directions. So if you are at this point, then horizontal plane, whatever angle it makes, it contains this line for sure. So there are some interesting pictures of um, horizontal uh, Heisenberg group. And uh, one of the famous pictures is um, drawing a sample of these horizontal planes that are pointing to towards the origin. So kind of a skewer, if you like kebabs, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so uh, now we are at this point, ignore the others, and I wanna find one horizontal curve connecting origin to that, and this observation that horizontal planes do contain this direction gives me a simple choice. So I, dec I go with the curve gamma s being s x1, s y1, and then zero. It's a planar curve where s starts at zero and ends at one. So this is a curve that definitely um, joins zero to p1. And then gamma prime of s, as I mentioned, is pointing in that direction, belongs to the horizontal plane at gamma s for not just almost every, but for all s. So gamma is a horizontal curve Thus, by definition, DCC, which is the infimum of length of horizontal curves connecting two points, will be less than or equal to the length of this particular gamma. But uh, the length here, if you write gamma prime of S, this will be X1 times the vector X plus y1, the vector y. You can easily check this. In this case, I think, oh no, I don't want to claim it. Yeah, it agrees with, of course, partial. So you can replace these with partial as well. But I write it this way because from this point of view, I know how much the length g will be from, uh, zero to one and this is simply the the gamma prime yeah length will be the length of actually also the projection so everything from many different angles we can see why this is equal to that ds but uh, this is independent of s so it pops out and equals the quantity x1 to the power 2 plus y1 to the power 2. So we found one particular horizontal curve with this length, therefore DCC is less than that, and we had seen that DCC is always more than that. Therefore, so DCC of p1 and 0 
is indeed just equal to x12 plus y1 to the power 2. That's the end of the story and our first very explicit and exact calculation for uh, distance between two points in the Carnot-Carr theory metric. If you have two points like this, one is at the origin and the other is x1, y1, and 0, then the Carnot-Carr theory distance of p1 to 0, we saw that happens to be just the Euclidean distance of them. And that straight line joining them is a horizontal curve connecting them. Okay. So this is a, this is a good start for understanding the DCC metric. And the next session, again, based on this these facts about projection, we will be able to actually prove finally why DCC metric is finite. Until then, have a good one. And please put your questions in the comments before things get really complicated. Uh, let me know if there are any inaccuracies, any vague parts.